Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Carol Christ. I'm the Chancellor of Berkeley and it's a delight to welcome you to this event this afternoon. You're here to hear a conversation which has the title, The Future of Humans, Gene Editing and the Unthinkable Power to Control Evolution. Um, that title to me, recalled the um, anniversary of the 200th, the 200th anniversary of the publication of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in um, 1818. Um, Frankenstein is the prototypical text of the human ability to create new life, and it's really a prescient text, particularly at the moment when scientists have the power to manipulate the blueprint of life. This is a bold topic and a perfect way to kick off a Berkeley sesquicentennial, which we're celebrating with the official model, Fiat Lux, or Let There Be Light. This motto, inscribed in the university seal and on the five-pointed star that adorns Sather Gate, reminds us that it's our duty to create new knowledge and bring it to light to illuminate solutions for the world's greatest problems and find solutions for bettering the human condition. As we celebrate 150 years of light at Berkeley and we anticipate 150 years of light in the future, the discovery of CRISPR by Jennifer Doudna and the global impact that this will have comes immediately to mind. Few breakthroughs in science have had the kind of sweeping, immediate impact that CRISPR has, bringing monumental change to the way scientists approach key questions of life and holding unlimited promise for the future. It's exhilarating to imagine the transformations we'll see as the result of this technology in the coming years. Our special guest, Dr. Mukherjee, is an oncologist at Columbia University and Pulitzer Prize winner for his book, The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer. His most recent book, The Gene and Intimate History, chronicles the history of the genre, gene and what becomes of humanity when we can read and edit our own genetic information. A Rhodes Scholar, he has earned degrees from Stanford University, the University of Oxford, and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Jennifer Doudna has been a member of the Berkeley faculty since 2002 and is the founding executive director of the Innovative Genomics Institute, a joint endeavor of UC Berkeley and UCSF. And I'd like particularly to welcome UCSF's Chancellor Sam Hoggood to um, this program. Since her days as a graduate student and postdoc at Harvard and the University of Colorado, Jennifer has always been interested in structural biology and the biochemistry of RNA. In 2012, she and her uh, co a colleague, Emmanuel Charpentier, discovered CRISPR. Um, and that's a game changer. It holds potential to cure genetic diseases, overcome climate change, and address global food security, among many other transformational applications. Dr. Doudna's contributions, her light, are significant and worthy of celebration. Please welcome Jennifer Doudna and Dr. Mukherjee. Well, thank you, uh, Chancellor Christ, for that very warm introduction. And thank you to all of you for, for uh, coming today. We're really looking forward to this conversation. We will uh, talk for about 45 minutes, uh, and then we'd like to open up the floor to questions to answer uh, thoughts and ideas and, and give you a chance to share those with us. So I'd like to start off by, um, by pointing out that you know humanity has always had a desire for improvement. Cars uh, improved transportation, penicillin improved health, the internet improved the spread of information or misinformation in the, that some cases. Now it appears that we're entering a new stage of improvement. Artificial intelligence to improve efficiency, self-driving cars to improve safety, and the improvement of our own bodies. So we have to truly ask ourselves, what are we improving? Do we need improving? And even what is improvement? 
So gene editing technologies and cancer therapies are forcing us to look at these questions and also to look at ourselves. Cancer, for example, is a natural and common cause of death. Genetic diseases are too numerous to count and a natural result of our being human. A new wave of biomedical advances are giving us the ability to push back cancer and erase genetic diseases, but, but at what cost? So I'd like to start this conversation by, by asking uh, you, Dr. Mukherjee, um, are we transitioning from natural to unnatural, or, or is this just the next step in human evolution? So um, again, I think the question of what natural and unnatural is or are has been really brought about in the last decade or so in a way with an urgency that really didn't exist before. Um, Oscar Wilde famously said, being natural is sometimes just a pose. Um, and the question is, how are we posing? What, what, what pose are we on? Um, I, I do think that the capacity to change something as elemental as our own DNA, even if it's in somatic cells, um, certainly in stem cells and certainly in, in embryonic cells, really raises the question about how, how, what we're doing with our own evolution. These are unprecedented technologies because they allow us to hold the horns of, of our own destiny in some ways, even though we understand destiny is more than DNA, but a powerful element of destiny is in DNA. You gave the example of cancer and genetic diseases. So, Really, the question of what is natural and what is unnatural, the boundaries, I think, have been redrawn or are being redrawn today. Um, I, my own thoughts about this really are, are the thoughts of a physician. That's my brain. My, I have a physician's brain. And that is that as we do this, as we enter this arena of new technologies, it seems to me that there are, and I, and I talked a little bit about this in the gene, that there are a triangle of ideas uh, which we should keep in, 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 in focus. Um, the first one is when we intervene, when we're intervening on human um, genetics, is there extraordinary suffering involved? Um, you and I can then open up a debate saying, well, what is extraordinary suffering? Um, but at least there is a sense, there's a hard line that we draw and say that in, in, when we move forward, that, the, that, that that remains a certain line in the sand, that we invade on what is natural versus unnatural only when we think that there's extraordinary suffering involved. In a second, I'll tell you that there are people who don't buy this argument. Right? I'll tell you about, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's one line of the triangle. The second line of the triangle is loosely, I've called it in the book, I've called it penetrance, I've called it the idea is, we can call it certainty, that when we make genetic changes, when we do tamper with evolution, particularly with our own, own evolution, that we have a, a strong degree of certainty that there's a powerful relationship between the gene and the phenotype or the, or the ultimate manifestation that's involved. So things that we're uncertain about, things that have effects that we don't understand, cascading effects, pleiotropic effects, we probably should avoid um, since obviously we don't want to intervene on things that we don't ultimately, we cannot ultimately control. Um, and the third line of the triangle is, 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 I've called it justifiable choice. People have used different words for it. And that is that when we intervene between what is unnatural and what is natural, that the intervention bears some justification, that we can justify it, um, that it that, and that it's, that it's not done by state mandate, that individual choices involve mm -hmm. people. People are able to do it or not able to do it um, as they should choose. Now, it doesn't take an extraordinarily complicated bit of thinking to realize that each of these is fuzzy territory. Um, who defines extraordinary suffering? Who mandates choice? Who decides, you know, if the world, if our cultures push us towards manipulating our children, um, is that really a choice? Even if it's, if it's a passive choice, does it really become a choice? And, and by the way, different cultures might make different choices. For instance, exactly. And, and you know, just to give you, yeah. you, you know better than anyone else, um, the rules that apply for interventions on embryos in China are not the rules that apply for intervention in the United States and other cultures. So, um, so I, I fully understand this is complicated territory. But as we move forward, if we don't 
if we don't draw some stakes, this is going to become, I think, a even more complicated than it than it is. So um, uh, it is absolutely true that we're we're drawing we're, we're passing a boundary between between the natural and the un unnatural. Those were those terms were never easily defined, uh, never easily definable. But the technologies allow us to, they're forcing us to define them. And, and my argument is that we should use a kind of more sympathetic way, a humanistic way, to try to breach those boundaries. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what do you think? In fact, some of these recommendations have been made. You've been on panels that have, been, that have made these recommendations for intervention in the human embryos. What are your thoughts about, about these, the breaching of the, of the natural? Well, I, I, while you were talking, I was thinking that you know, at the, we had a meeting in 2015 in the Napa Valley that was the first meeting is organized by the Innovative Genomics Institute and UCSF to think about the ethical and societal implications of human genome editing. And there was a, you know, it was a fairly small group of people. We had two of the scientists who had been involved in the 1970s discussions in Asilomar about the ethics of molecular cloning, Paul Berg and, and David Baltimore. And even in that group of, of scientists, there was a very active uh, discussion around the table heated at times, you know, people really disagreeing and debating about, uh, in particular, about human embryo editing, so making changes that would be become uh, inherited in future generations and the, what would be the imp implications of that. And at one point, somebody leaned across the table and said, wait a minute, there might, become a mom there might come a moment when we will consider it unethical not to do that at least for certain kinds of, you know, and it's like you're saying about, you know, if there's severe suffering due to genetic disease, this might in the future be something that we would, you know, our societally agree should, should proceed. So my own views, you know, it's interesting for me because I have found that my own views have been evolving. Yes, I know, and you've written about this. So tell, tell, tell us yeah. about the evolution. Tell us about yeah, a little bit I, about I guess I, you know, I started off, you know, when I first started thinking about the implications of gene editing back in, uh, you know, in sort of the early days of, of this work, which was uh, actually only a few years ago now, um, and uh, started thinking about this, I, I felt initially very opposed to using gene editing in, in embryos. Um, not necessarily forever, but I certainly felt that the time wasn't, wasn't now to, to proceed to do that. And um, why did I think that? Well, I just, it seemed to me, uh, you know, it seemed unnatural. You know, it seemed uh, something that, you know, you're sort of messing with something that maybe you shouldn't mess with. And as a scientist, I also appreciate that in many cases, a gene, uh, and you know this better than, than anyone probably, but, you know, a gene uh, that we think does, has a certain function, might only play that role in a particular context of other genes. So how can we ever really be sure that something we're, we're altering might not, uh, you know, have unintended consequences, and that would have consequences in not only a, a person, but all of their kids and their kids' kids, you know, and it seemed, it seemed kind of a profound thing. But what's happened over the last few years for me, and you know, for those of you that don't know me, so I'm a, you know, I'm a biochemist, and I've always done very fundamental research. So un unlike, uh, unlike you said, I, you know, I've, I've always just been working on molecules rather than, than patients or people. And, uh, but what's happened over the last few years is that I've been coming into increasing contact with people that have genetic disease, either themselves or in their families. I, I recently got an email, and this is very typical for me these days, but I got an email from a woman who explained that her, her beautiful young boy has a, a genetic disease that had just been diagnosed, and she sent me a picture of this little baby in his, his little, little carrier, you know, and he's cute, and, 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 you know, it was just, it broke my heart. It really broke my heart. And I, I just, I guess I've found myself recognizing that, you know, when there is severe suffering and we have an opportunity to change that, it, it may be worth doing. All right. Well, you know, one line that philosophers have tried to draw um, is between emancipation and, um, and enhancement. Um, yeah. And they have tried to draw a strong line between emancipation. Of course, in real practice, once you practice medicine, those lines also become fuzzy. Um, what is, you know, what is emancipation for one person can be enhancement for the other. Some, the, the extremes are quite obvious. Yeah. It's very easy to think about extremes, you know, 
manipulating genes for cosmetic purposes seems you know, very obviously uh, far outside the realm of what we want to do. With, uh, with, with, but on the other hand, there are certainly examples where, where the conflicts are, are, are more real. The, I mean, the question that occurs to me, I'm going to frame the question and then maybe subdivide it a little bit. One question that occurred to me while I was thinking about this is, um, you know, we're always in medicine straddling the line between treating and curing. Sure. Um, but now we are beginning to think about altering DNA as a mechanism or a means to treat and cure. Is that reasonable? Um, and, and maybe you can speak about it in sort of three categories and, and divide it up as you fit, wish. But it seems to me that there are three broad categories. Number one is uh, editing genes of other organisms very widely speaking. So all other organisms, uh, that, that's, like, that's a little bit like saying uh, humans and all other organisms, but, but, <laughs> but, but, but really the, imagine the entire, you know, the, the question of, 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 of editing genes and other organisms and crops and plants and pests. The second is somatic um, gene editing. So particularly things, I'm a transplanter, so in, the, in, in stem cells, blood stem cells, other kinds of stem cells. And the third, of course, is gene editing in either sperm or eggs or embryos. So tell us about what you think the prospects are in these three categories. And, and, and is it reasonable? What is reasonable and what's unreasonable maybe in the three categories? Or pick, pick one of them which is most provocative for you. Well, so I think, I think you're touching on an important point, and that is that gene editing is, is used now widely in, a, you know, uh, sort of across the biosphere, I guess you could say. You know, it's really being used in plants, animals. It's enhancing the pace of research. Um, it's opening up organisms for study that in the past really could not be investigated at the genetic level. Uh, that, so it's, you know, it's a very exciting time, really, as a, as a biologist, uh, I think, to be you know, living in the midst of this transformational opportunity with, with new technologies. And it's not just gene editing, it's other things too, of course, that are converging to give us uh, ways that we can manipulate organisms that were unthinkable in the recent past. So just having the ability to sequence the entire genome, you know, all the DNA in, a, in the cell of an organism uh, and, un, and, and start understanding what, all the, what that code means, well, how, it, how, it, how it dictates what an organism becomes is, is really profound. I think that, um, you know, so in, just to quickly touch on the points that you, those three areas. So, so if we think about using gene editing in um, organisms other than, than humans, clearly this is going to have a big impact on, on, uh, on humanity, right? Because it'll allow us to change plants, for example, to be more nutritious or to grow in environments that where they otherwise wouldn't thrive. Uh, mosquitoes. Uh, get rid of mosquitoes, uh, maybe, maybe, or at least controlled spread of disease by, by insects. And, um, you know, and, and then in terms of, of editing what, you're, what you referred to as somatic cells, and just so that everyone's on the same page with that, that term just means that we're editing cells that are not, uh, not, not germline cells, meaning they're not uh, cells that are eggs or sperm or embryos. So they don't cause heritable changes in future uh, generations of organisms. But this could still be incredibly impactful for the clinical application of gene editing in the type of research that you do, for yep. example, right? being able to um, edit, let's say, uh, immune cells so that they're more effective at targeting cancer would be, would be amazing if, if we can do that. Um, editing blood cells so they no longer carry the disease-causing gene for sickle cell anemia would be, would be incredible. And there's many, many other examples like that. And then the third category is the one that is more kind of ethically fraught, which is, or, or could be, uh, which is, you know, should it be okay or is it okay to make changes in the germline of humans? People are, believe me, scientists are already doing this in the germlines of other kinds of organisms uh, quite routinely. But in humans, no, not, not yet. And, and should, we, should we go there? And I, I personally think that, uh, that, it, that, will, that it's going to happen. And it's partly going to happen because of the fact that you know, different cultures view this question differently. And I think we're seeing already that in the scientific world that the pace of, of research, at least, on human embryo editing is proceeding differently in different countries. So uh, just a quick follow-up on that question, and then uh, let's, we can move on. But how long till the first transgenic human? Um, oh, dear. I'm on the spot here. Uh, I, I don't. I, 
I don't know is the, is the short answer. I, I think that, you know, just again, just to, so that everyone out there sort of understands what's happening. I mean, we saw just in the last six months, there have been two uh, very prominent publications in yep. scientific journals from highly respected research labs, one here in the United States and, and, and one in the United Kingdom, who both showed that you could use gene editing in viable human embryos uh, to uh, change, to alter the genome, to make a very precise change to a particular gene in these embryos. And it, there's been some question about there's been questions. questions about the details of how that's working. But I think the the overarching uh, you know thing that I take from that is that this this uh, this research is proceeding, and it, it's going to it's going to I think the pace will accelerate. Um, I recently heard from a colleague in China who is coming to visit me here at Berkeley next week who is, wants to give me an update on his own research in human embryos. So, you know, it's, it's, it's moving forward. I can't tell you when I think it'll be actually used to create a CRISPR baby, for example, but, but I think we're seeing a steady progression in that direction. I mean, just to give you one example, um, I work with blood stem cells and immune cells. That's most of my leukemia, biologist, leukemia doctor. Uh, as of last week, uh, we were just talking about this earlier on, as of last week, in cord blood stem cells, we are getting edited uh, gene editing successfully in 90% of the stem cells. Yeah. Um, in fact, we, we've gotten to a place where not, we're worry, worry, wondering whether we should even sort these cells because the, the, the efficiency of sorting is getting to the place where the efficiency of editing. Yeah. Um, so, that, um, so basically, I suspect that the blood system is open for business. The entire blood system is open for business. Um, we, we, there's many, many questions, off-target effects, whether they will get weird leukemias that arise because we've you know, made an, uh, 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 an edit in the wrong place. But essentially speaking, the, 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 it's, it's staggering. Uh, we, we couldn't do this so, six so months ago. This is this is a very important point. I mean, the field of, of this sort of this technology and all the things that are being done with it are moving forward incredibly quickly. And one of the things that that's been on my mind is how do we how do we explain to people that are not in in the you know down in the weeds doing the work, working in the clinic or working in the laboratory? How do we explain what's happening? Because I think we appreciate that this is ultimately going to affect everyone's life. And, and I think that one of the ways that you know, people learn about science, they learn about technology, is actually through, through the media, through Hollywood, uh, through books, of course, um, and through, uh, through fiction and nonfiction. But they, you know, they sort of start to understand what's happening. We're seeing this with, of course, artificial intelligence has been all over the media lately and self-driving cars and things. And, and a little bit, you know, genome editing is sort of creeping in there. So I wanted to ask you what you think uh, Hollywood has done well, and, and, and what, what, have they, what have they done poorly, and, and how, do we, how, do we, how do we work with people that like to tell stories, and they do that for a business, uh, and for, you know, professionally, and work with them to get science right? Well, it's, it's, a, it's always a struggle. Um, one of the strangest experiences of my life was being a, a small consultant on Logan. Um, it's true. If you yeah. if you were to sit through the final <laughs> wow. credits, uh, there I, there I have a, I have a small and that's because um, the I mean I, I think I'm, I'm speaking correctly. I, you know I, I barely enter this particularly the Hollywood world, but I was approached by a friend of a friend of a friend uh, who uh, showed me the script, and I said, well, you know, the script is really fundamentally about a dystopic vision of what happens when human beings start reaching for certain kinds of perfection. It, it, pushes, <laughs> it pushes towards the enhancement de debate away from the emancipation debate. And my only thought about it was I think it's not dystopic enough. Um, and I, I think, I think that in, in so, so, so there's, a, there's a moment in, in, in that film, uh, which actually I watched a very early version of, uh, there's a moment in the film when you suddenly realize um, there's a moment in which um, the characters are walking through a cornfield or something, and you suddenly realize that the entirety of the world has now been transformed for human benefit because the corn is growing 10 times as high. I think that, that, that was my input in the film, as in make it more dystopic. But just to remind us 
just to remind ourselves that I think, I think the media has a big responsibility here. Um, I think explaining, I think again, it would be very helpful for us from the media to get a roadmap of what the pulse of public thinking about this is. Because the media reflects back to a large extent mm -hmm. what a much larger pu public view of all of this is. Um, that would be what's helpful, not to set guidelines, not to tell us about the science often, um, but to tell us, you know, so, and that's what I think is important about the films. The film may, may, may get the science wrong, they may get it too far off, et cetera, et cetera. But what they often get right is they get the pulse of mm -hmm. what people's fears are. What are they afraid of the most? What are the concerns? Or what are they excited about? Or what are they excited about? Um, you know, um, a film like, I'm just thinking of off the top of my head, um, a film like Lorenzo's Oil is a, is a great example. It, we could disagree about the science. We know that it's very complicated. People had disagreements, agreements. But what it got right very much was the obsessive hunting of a parent for a cure for their child. That's what it gets very right. Mm -hmm. And as long as the pulse is right, it reminds us, it keeps us, I think, as physicians, as scientists, honest about what we're writing about. What are the concerns? We're, 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 you know, sure, we're talking about powerful technologies. Who are, who's going to draw the limits? How are we going to, uh, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to move forward? Um, and I think that's what, that's what the ultimate, that's what ultimately helps. It keeps, in some ways, Hollywood gets it right when its moral compass is right, when it sets our moral compass right. Hollywood gets it wrong when it tries to, you know, tell us about science, I suppose, in a way that's too, you know, it just it, it doesn't make any realistic sense. I, I, so for me, like, I, I thought the movie The Martian was a great film that you know, uh -huh. really kind it. of captured the excitement of an adventure and the challenges that one might imagine happening if you tried to actually survive on Mars. And, right. And it's sort of just, you know, beyond where we think we are right now in terms of technologies. But it, I think it, you know, I noticed that it captured a lot of people's attention and imagination. And, you know, my, I have a teenage son and just, you know, hearing his chatting about this with his friends. And, you know, you could just kind of sense this, this sort of buzz. So I think films like that are great because they, they actually, they make people think about science. They, they think about the, um, the opportunities. You know, if we develop technologies, that might allow us to explore our solar system in ways that we haven't been able to. Well, sometime in the next few years, there's going to be a fictionalized version of a Jennifer Doudna movie. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Horrifying thought. <laughs> what would you what would you what would you like to ensure is in that film? Is in or is not in? In. Uh, well, tell us both. Tell us both. Make it exciting. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, again, I guess to me, I, I like it when films capture the passion that somebody has for work they're doing. Um, for uh, you know the sort of the the struggles. I mean, you know, I think you know, as students now will often ask me. You know, I, I feel almost a little bit embarrassed because I think they think that I'm uh, you know sort of uh, reached some some pedestal or something. And I don't think of myself that way at all. I think of myself growing up in this little rural town in Hawaii and you know struggling through general chemistry in college and trying to figure out can I really be a scientist and and uh, you know and I I. I I think a movie to be true to, if it wants to be true, it maybe doesn't, but you know, if it really wanted to capture anything that's true about me, it would have to show those struggles and, and it would have to, um, you know, show the, you know, it's again, it's kind of back to the human spirit, isn't it? It's about, you know, all of us, I think, you know, we're, we're, we have passions for certain things and that's one of the things you learn in college is you kind of learn about yourself and what you find exciting and, you know, for me it was about, you know, realizing that I was just a person that loved to loved to think about molecules. You know, I loved to think about how how life works at the level of molecules. And and so I, you know, but but it's it hasn't been a straight path at all. And I would definitely want a story to capture that. And and just just uh, tell us about uh, and and tell us about uh, the, the, a lot has been written about you know the the initial series of conversations that you had with Emmanuel. Um, 
at the start of this. Tell us about the, the actually, I, I've never read uh, about the, the kind of moment. Was there a moment when things crystallized uh, for you? Well, I think I think there've been been a few of those. I mean, uh, you know, when I think back on pick one, pick one, pick one. Okay. Um, well, probably that I should pick the first one then, which is really when I met her, and you know, we we met at a meeting in in 2011. It was a meeting I, you know, almost didn't go to because it was a, a meeting for microbiologists, which is certainly not me. And and I was busy, and I was teaching here at Berkeley, and I was you know juggling all the usual things that we juggle. And uh, I almost canceled it, but then I I. Did decided to go, and it's good that I did, because that's where I met uh, Emmanuelle Charpentier, and, and um, she is a microbiologist, so she had good, legitimate reason to be there. And uh, when we met at this meeting, we met there because we were both working on what at the time was a very obscure area of biology, namely understanding how bacteria fight viral infection using a system called CRISPR. It's an adaptive immune system in bacteria. And uh, so we were both giving talks at this little session at this meeting. And afterwards, we went out to lunch, you know, and we started chatting, and we started walking around the old uh, cobblestone streets of old San Juan, uh, Puerto Rico. And in that conversation, you know, we talked about starting a collaboration to work together to figure out the function of one protein, just one protein that's part of this immune system, a protein called Cas9. And um, it was a project that really kind of, you know, brought together expertise from her lab as a microbiologist and my lab as a biochemist. And um, I do remember feeling a real sense of sort of the hairs on my neck standing up because I could, I could sense that there was something very exciting about this project. And, you know, and in some ways the rest of it is, uh, you know, it's kind of a... So, so I, I can tell you my story about that story is that I heard about from from of all people in the world I heard about the your early results from Paul Berg. I was I went to Stanford uh, for another visit. I have collaborators there. I trained with Paul, and Paul um, as Paul had as you very much know very, it was among the many people who discovered how to clone, um, make recombinant DNA, stitch two pieces of DNA from two foreign organisms together. Um, and was instrumental in the Asilomar meeting, which was an important milestone in all of this. And I would, once in a while, I, since becoming a physician and a scientist myself, I'd go back to Stanford and I would always have lunch with Paul. Um, and these were, you know, very precious to me. And he's now 90 years old. Was, this was about when he was 87 or something. And he told me, you know, I just heard a seminar from someone and she talked about a, an enzyme that allows you to modify DNA in a site-specific manner. And I thought, my God, the old man has finally lost it. <laughs> I, was, I said, wow. <laughs> But, uh, but <laughs> because it was it was it was a little unfathomable. You know, people had been thinking about oh, this right. for a long time, yeah. and it was a little unfathomable. And of course, the fact that it was borrowed back from the bacterial world, just to move the conversation along, um, flipping over the question of Hollywood is a very pertinent political question today, which is uh, we are living in times where we uh, the, the amount of distrust for science is phenomenal. Uh, uh, and I have to tell people constantly that science is not fake news, uh, that there's a strong line between one and the other. Evolution is not fake news. Um, bacterial evolution is not fake news. So um, wh what do we do about this moment? I mean, do we have a responsibility? There are, th th we have uh, really an unprecedented m moment in human history, in, in American history, uh, a, a country that grew to some extent politically out of scientists and engineers. Um, um, the, the, the history of this country, I'm an immigrant, so the history of this country is a country that grew out of the aspirations of humanists, scientists, and engineers. What do we do about this today? What are you doing, Jennifer? What, what, how does the world look to you? I'm very concerned about this. I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's a big challenge. I think we have to start by encouraging uh, scientists everywhere to get out of the lab at some, at some level and, and engage in, in conversation. We have, to, we have to talk about science. We need to bring science back into the kind of the, you know, discussions that we have at cocktail parties and things like that. Um, I, I think that 
that uh, you know books like 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 your your books I think are, are are doing a lot to kind of you know I think you're very good at telling stories that are very human and that people can identify with so they don't necessarily think about you as a you know I mean hopefully they, I'm sure they think about you as a scientist but they read the book because it's really interesting it's really engaging right it's not a textbook it's something that is very human and I think the more that we can do that and and show people that uh, you know and and use language to describe scientific ideas that isn't, you know, isn't filled with acronyms and you know, doesn't sound like a foreign language, but we try to really just explain ideas. Because I think, in the end, a lot of the ideas that we're having and thinking about are not really complicated. They're not. It's just, you know, the, maybe the details are, but I think the concepts and ideas are not. And this is something that we just have to work at more than I think we have, in, in, certainly in my lifetime as a professional right. scientist. Um, how, what would you, how would you answer that? Um, well, well, I can't agree more. I think there is a, I think what I worry most about is that there's a dispiriting quality for young students, for, for my students. There's a dispiriting quality in, in all of this. Um, and the, the dispiriting quality lasts generations. It's not, a, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's a, it carries through. Um, and I think this is an especial time. Um, um, you know, it, it, I'm not going to say it, it's not, it's not go hug a scientist day, but, <laughs> but I think there's an especial time when we need to remind ourselves that, that the contributions of, of, of science to this debate, to this, I mean, look at, for instance, Look at climate change. Um, mm -hmm. We need before we have arguments and co conversation. We need data. Data comes from laboratories, from scientists who've spent time gathering it. We need to respect that idea that we don't. We, we can't enter these debates without data. Um, so, so just be just be careful. Be cognizant of the fact that yeah. the scientists in your life around you are in dis are dispirited and try to encourage them. It might be philanthropically, it might not be, it might be personally, but it's, it's, it's a tough time for the graduate students and the postdocs in my lab. I don't so, know if you're feeling that. So well. has, your, has your, your work, and especially maybe your writing, has that led you to have conversations and interactions with new groups of people that, you, you know, that have sort of taken you in new directions? Um, well, certainly politically, yes. I mean, Emperor, um, as you know, you know, the, the once the, the my first book on the history of can on cancer um, uh, ha was was well read. But then Ken Burns uh, made a documentary out of it. The gene is also going to be made into a documentary by Ken Burns. Uh, we, uh, you should probably not tweet that until it's formally announced. Uh, <laughs> no tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be announced in a week or two. <laughs> so, um, but we're in the middle of filming. Um, in fact, we filmed you, Jennifer. Um, and so I think that um, the, the transition into serious documentary, these are three hours, or in the case of Emperor, six hour documentaries, allowed us to reach a certain a, a group of people. Um, um, I think um, one of the most interesting conversations that I've, I've had recently um, is with people who work on um, you know, um, education for children. How, how, do you, how do you take textbooks, which are, which are becoming more and more outdated in some, to some ways, um, how do you convert that into education for children? How do you make it possible to put that on the web uh, to some extent, but supplement that with, with books that are more readable? Um, and that's one initiative that I'm very interested in. How do you make a kind of simultaneous storytelling as well as 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 didactic uh, education for AP, for instance, um, which is much more accessible um, and doesn't remain, you know, a boring old textbook. I think kids are actually a great way in too. You know, I had this great experience a couple of years ago where I, you know, I, my son was in seventh grade at the time and he was just taking a class. And they were teaching the kids about DNA, and so the teacher asked me would I, if I would come and talk to the kids a little bit about my work. And so I, I, I went to the school and we, we did it after school. So we just it was just voluntary. We just asked the kids, you know, who would like to do it. And for my first shock was I walked into this room thinking there might be two, three kids. There were 20 kids there. And 15 of them were girls. 
it was cool. Yeah. And the other thing was, so I, I, I thought, okay, how am I going to get these, you know, 12 year olds interested in what I do? So I thought, well, I'll take this, this 3D printed model that I have of the Cas9 protein. It's actually made by Jacob Korn, who's here in the audience um, here at the Innovative Genomics Institute. It's printed on a 3D printer, but it's based on uh, an actual crystallographic structure of the Cas9 protein, which is the scissors that cuts the DNA, and the RNA molecule that programs it to find and cut a particular sequence of DNA. That's what makes it a powerful tool. And then the DNA itself getting cut. And so I took this model. It's about this big. It's about you know, the size of a football or so. I took it in. And it, the model was designed by Jacob very nicely so that it can be pulled apart. You can actually pull the DNA out. You can we see where the DNA got cut. I should have brought it. It would have been fun. Um, but, but I took it to the kids. And I thought, well, I won't, I won't actually take it apart. I won't show them actually how, it, how the DNA gets cut, because that might just be too complicated for the kids. So I had this model. But it's, it's brightly colored. And you know, it looks kind of cool. And so the kids said, well, can you pass it around? So I, I I started passing this thing around, and I was describing it to them. Within five seconds, of course, right? They had pulled. The, they're like, "Oh, look, cool! The DNA comes out. Hey, we can pop this piece off." And you know, they were dissembling it, and they were looking at it, and you know, they were figuring it out, and they were asking tons of questions. And actually, they asked a number of really interesting ethical questions. So I think one of the kids at that that um, little meeting asked me about the ethics of of uh, not really put, not really using that language, but asked me, you know, what 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 does this mean for changing embryos, you know, humans? And doesn't that mean that, you know, you could you could decide to make somebody taller or smarter or, you know, wow. And, you know, just kind of grappling. You could see the thought process going. So I really think that the more that we can reach out to kids, because kids are, I think kids are natural scientists. You know, they love, they love questions. And the more that we can do that and get them engaged, they don't think about science as a as a thing. You know, it's just, it's just sort of, you know, it's an it's it's something that's interesting that's entered their world. Should we, should we, are we getting ready for questions? We're, we want to turn it over to questions yeah. from the audience, but I, I want to, before we do that, I just want to, I want to cover one more thing uh, with you, Sid, and that is I, I would love to hear the motivation that you had for writing your first book, because I think, you know, for me, uh, The Emperor of All Maladies, you know, your, your first book about cancer, I mean, it really is a profound uh, work. It's very, very in, in some ways, very depressing, but it's also incredibly interesting to look at the history of you know, how humans have grappled with this, this, this really intractable disease. I, I'd love to hear what, you, what, you, what motivated you to do it, uh, what was most surprising to you about that process, and uh, was, was it fun, was it hard? You know, tell, tell us about that. So, um, you know, I had, I had never thought I would write a book. Um, uh, I was uh, trained as a physician scientist, uh, very nose to the ground. Um, and um, the Emperor of All Maladies really grew out of a patient's question. Um, and the patient's question was, she was in the middle of chemotherapy for a sarcoma, and she said, why are we doing this, and where are we going? And it seemed to me just astonishing that here was this disease that has occupied our culture. Um, you know, it is, cancer has become more than a disease. It is a metaphor. It is an allegory. Um, it is a, people use it to describe states of mind. Um, very few illnesses in human history have ascended to this kind of space in human culture. Um, so, and yet we had no real history. We had no book about it uh, in the same sense. People had written about cancer in a thousand ways that were million textbooks on it. Um, so that was really the beginning of that book. Um, I started as a fellow um, in, um, and I would work du in, uh, during the day. I would be in the clinic, um, and in the evenings I would write. And it was just a journal to start with. Um, and it grew and grew and grew. And at some point of time, I decided that I would show it to a publisher. And someone said to me that, you know, there are going to be, you know, you know there are going to be two readers for that book, your mother and you. Um, um, 600 pages on cancer. You know, when it was first, uh, when it was first delivered, it was like, uh, someone said it was like a, a phone directory from 
in the days that there used to be phone directories, a, a phone directory from hell. It had a, it had a black cover. Um, in the back, it had, in white, it had cancer written on it. And it was 1,800 pages long. It had cut down to 600 odd pages. So that's how I, I started. That was, my, that was my first book. Fascinating, yeah. <laughs> Sounds hard, yeah. working in the clinic during the day and writing yeah. at night. Wow, I'm amazed that you could do that. And, and, and your second book, so uh, well-received as well. Um, and you know, um, many people have read the gene that I've run into just sort of randomly. Um, but, but also, you, know, you, you encountered some criticisms about the book. T tell us about that experience. Well, so the main, again, it's the experience of distilling very complex science to simple, you can't satisfy everyone. The simplification is absolutely necessary. Um, you, I mean, in the first draft, again, it was, it was delivered at 1,800 odd pages. It had to be cut down to 600, and I have to do most of the cutting. And so things get left on the floor. Things have to be cut, sure. cut off and left on the floor. So, you know, you have to have a radical simplification in many places, and people don't, scientists don't like being simplified. They don't like their work being simplified. Um, but in order to communicate with, with a much wider audience, you have to take away terminology, take away even people. Um, uh, too many names becomes word salad. Readers get switched off. Um, if you use too much terminology, people get switched off. So that's one. So there's, you know, the criticisms of omission um, are, is one area. The, the controversial, one of the controversial parts of the book involve questions like race and IQ. Um, yeah. And um, those, um, I really thought that for this, for this book, it was, it was odd. This was before, long before these questions had become very central. Um, um, so there's a chapter on race and a chapter on IQ, both of which were read by um, uh, people I respected in the field. Um, actually, Marcus Feldman over at Stanford, um, mm -hmm. who you know very well, was a very important uh, person who read the race chapter on race. The chapter on IQ was, was also read by many, many people in the uh, psychiatric community. I really felt that those were important to put in. Um, in retrospect, I feel even more strongly that they were important to put in, but uh, there are disagreements about some of these fundamental questions. So, uh, you know, it's part of the it, it's part of the territory. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll continue this uh, since we're speaking about books and words. Um, you know, I'm very sensitive to the idea of words around uh, words like war on mm -hmm. cancer, mm -hmm. battle on cancer. Um, some, some people, some patients don't like it. One woman famously said to me, um, you go fight the war. Um, you know, um, hmm. it, 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 this is not a word that I want to own. Others want to own that word. It somehow helps the, the idea of them fighting something in their own bodies helps them. Um, what do you feel about the word gene editing? What do you feel about the word um, uh, you know, the various words. Tell us what the various words have been and, and how, what did you coin yourself? How do you use your, what, 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 is the, what do you say yourself when you use these words? Genetic surgery has been used um, to describe this. What, what, what's your sense of any of this? Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen an interesting, I, I, I've noticed a, a kind of an interesting evolution in the language around gene editing. So um, it, it started off as people would pretty much universally call it genome engineering, right? Genome engineering. And, and um, this kind of came about, I think, due to there, you know, there were obviously CRISPR was not the first way to modify genomes. There were earlier technologies for doing this. And they really were engineering in the sense that you actually had to engineer proteins individually to make targeted changes to DNA and cells. And that involved a lot of work and a lot of, you know, uh, uh, you know engineering in the lab, engineering of proteins. And, um, and then with, when, when CRISPR came along, initially um, this, the same language was applied to it. But, but what's happened, and it's, you know, and this wasn't me at all, this was like sort of just sort of happened very organically, I think, in the field, is that people began to adopt the language gene editing. Why? Well, I, I think that it's because it, it sort of reflects the maybe simpler nature of this technology in the sense that it doesn't require a lot of engineering for this tool to be employed in, when did you, you know, hear the, cell. When did you hear that phrase first? 
Jennifer. You gene, know, gene, gene editing. editing yeah. Gene editing. I think it started um, sometime back around the time that we had the first uh, international conference in Washington at the end of 2015 on uh, on gene editing, and I think we used that language for that meeting. And maybe at some level that you know started to started to you know permeate the. The, the language that was used to describe it in other contexts. But I started to ask people, well, why, you know, why, like, people like George Church, you know, yep. do you use, why do you use, do you, you know, when do you use editing and when do you use engineering? And I think it was George that said, well, you know, I really think that the new ways of modifying genes are much more like editing than engineering because we don't have to engineer anything to do this. We can just use the tool. Right. And, and do you think uh, moving forward, do you think this term will stick? Is it, is it easy for you now to use this, do you find it, there's a facility with it? That I think so. I mean, I, I, I'm curious to know, you know, and I, I try to ask this question of people that are not scientists, you know, ask them, how, you know, how they react to that. What does that mean to you? If, if someone says gene editing, does that mean anything or does it just, you know, is it opaque? Uh, but I think it's, I think it's fairly descriptive of what right. it is that we're really doing because if you think about it, it's really a tool, it's really a technology that's all about rewriting DNA, right? right. We, we, you know, we've been able to synthesize DNA so we can, we can, we can write it, we can erase it, we can cut it and paste it, and now we can rewrite it. And so I think it really is sort of analogous to having a, a text editor that you're using on the genetic code. Well, one of the astonishing things, I don't know how many people have worked with uh, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, one of the astonishing things as a user in, in human biology is how simple it is. Um, it is very, very simple, and maybe that's part of the captured in this in this in this idea of gene editing. Um, it seems to me, you know, one one thought I had is that for a long time I struggled to figure out how it would help us therapeutically in cancer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, of course, to elucidate targets in cancer, to genetically manipulate cancer cells, it's really, really simplified. But could we use this therapeutically in cancer? Um, and I struggled with that for a while. And of course, the answer has now come to us. It's, you can't necessarily use it in cancer cells because evolution is working against you. You know, you have to essentially get it, we think, in 100% of the cancer cells. Otherwise, the ones that have not been edited will evolve and take over. Uh, maybe you can do it over and over again. But the fact that the immune system has now become quite clearly one of the mechanisms of controlling cancer, and immune cells you can manipulate and edit and thereby reintroduce them. So it's really a, given us a, a powerful way to think about cancer, not from the standpoint of cancer itself, but from the microenvironment around cancer. A couple of questions that uh, arise. One is, um, it seems to me that editing sperm and eggs or sperm and egg making cells is going to be easier than doing it in the entire embryo. Um, what do you think are the prospects of that? And, and is that something, do you see yourself as your own lab ever moving in that direction, making sperm and egg, edited sperm and eggs? Human sperm and eggs. So um, you know, I think you're absolutely right that my and, and I, you know, disclaimer is that I'm not a I'm not a human developmental biologist uh, by any stretch. But I think that you know, from what I've come to understand from talking to people that that are experts in this area, I, I think that that this is absolutely coming. You know, that it's going to be possible to, and it sort of it's going to obviate the question of editing human embryos because Which you won't need to, right? You won't need to. You'll edit the sperm and eggs, and um, um, you know, would I ever do this in my own lab? No, uh, <laughs> uh, not not for any reason other than that's not the kind of biologist that I am. You know, it's not the kind of expertise that I have. But I, I think that you're right that you know, the, in terms of thinking about future clinical impacts, this is an area of, of very active uh, development where there's likely to be real advances. Right. Yeah. What? It, it seems one, other, one piece of conversation we were having earlier, which is an important thread to pick up, is that it seems that a lot of the conversations have focused around gene editing, um, but we're also seeing the simultaneous development of other, other technologies. You mentioned one of them, embryology, stem cell biology. And the third one is, is artificial intelligence, deep learning. Yeah. Um, I, I have a couple of thoughts about um, deep learning and, and genetics, particularly from the standpoint of cancer, but I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. One thing that occurred to me was um, 
deep learning is beginning to elucidate things about our genome that I did not think possible before. Um, I, I read this fascinating study of um, uh, card early cardiovascular disease. Um, so if you take ca cardiovascular disease um, and you ask the question, how many patients with early cardiovascular disease can be explained by single gene mutations? Um, so, and this is how we grew up as biologists. We thought about mutation in a gene affecting a pathway, thereby uh, causing the change that leads to a disease, right? Very classical model, very classical genetic model of thinking. And cardiovascular disease, you know, familial hypercholesterolemia, you get elevated cholesterol, you have all sorts of problems. Um, this study um, looked at, if you take 100 people, um, only two of them, uh, two of those hundred can be explained by these sort of powerful single gene mutations that will increase uh, risk. The question is, what about the rest? What about the other 98? And for a long time, we didn't really know how to solve that problem. Um, my colleagues in sort of complex genomics tell me now that deep learning is beginning to solve these kinds of problems. That in fact, it turns out that complex human phenotype um, can often be explained by what I would call not shove, not shove effects. So, you know, those single genes were like shoves. They would push you strongly in one direction, but by nudge effects. Often hundreds or often even thousands of yeah. gene variants that nudge you towards, you know, have small effect in and of themselves, but as a network or maybe as in, 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 in the context, move you even a little bit, even slightly towards uh, your ultimately so the question really arises is that if that's going to be the case with most human diseases, and uh, does gene editing help with nudge effects? Can you imagine ways, or should we, will it only help with shove genes? Are, are we going to reach some kind of biological limit, as it were, to the capacity to manipulate human phenotype? It's a, it's a complicated question, so I don't know what your thoughts about that well, are. Well, I, I have two thoughts about that. I mean, one is that I think that CRISPR and, and sort of gene editing technologies that are you know, coming from that are, are going to help with nudge effects in the sense that they're going to help us uncover all the genes that are in those networks, right? And that's already happening. So there's lots and lots of laboratories now that are using gene editing, not in the clinic, but they're using it to understand the genetics of human disease. And they're doing it both in human cells and organoids, which are cultured you know, um, bits of organs that you can grow in the lab as well as in animal models of disease. So I think that's gonna be a very powerful way. And, and frankly, I totally agree with what you're saying about using artificial intelligence or machine learning to help us understand those networks because they're often complicated, right? Uh -huh. And you have, to, you have to really understand all the players that might con be contributing to a particular trait, for example. But the other way that I think that gene editing w will potentially have an impact clinically in the future, and we're not there today, but I think you know the technology is going in that direction is being able to edit or modify multiple genes at once. And you know, sometimes these okay, genes talk, talk are about that. well, sometimes these genes are found in very disparate parts of the of the genetic material, but sometimes they're actually uh, co-localizing in three-dimensional space. And there's more and more that's being learned about how that works in cells. And so I'm thinking that in the future, it may be possible to um, you know, use gene editing to alter multiple genes at once, maybe to remove whole segments of a genome that aren't necessary for certain kinds of developmental pathways, for example, in, in particular cell types. I think the opportunities for using it as a real tool of, of, um, of understanding of the genome are, are still really very much out there to, to be captured. So let me turn the question that you asked me in the beginning of the conversation back to you. Um, what does the phrase human evolution mean to you in 2018? What does the phrase human evolution mean to me in 2018? I think that we How has that on, changed for you? Well, I think we're on this incredible continuum of, uh, you know, it's a, it really is an exciting time. I feel many days, I just sort of feel a sense of wonder. You know, I feel amazed that I'm alive at this time when, you know, we're, we're sort of at this moment when um, all these technologies are coming together and for the first time we can do things. We, you know, like, like we said, like uh, in, in Chancellor Chris's introduction, you know, that we really have now the power to control 
evolution. And it's not just not just in principle our own. That's obviously still kind of you know uh, on the bleeding edge. But 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 to control evolution of other organisms in our in our environment. And I think that's a it's a really profound opportunity and a profound responsibility. So I hope that we can all you know work together and work as you're doing to educate people about the science behind this, so they can think about it and really contemplate. Um, is, what it, this means. is it possible to have an international moratorium until we decide this? Is it conceivable? No. <laughs> no, it's really not. Because, you know, as we discussed earlier, I mean, I think, you know, culturally, there are just many differences in the way people approach these things. And how would you enforce such a thing? But I think what one can do is engage in discussions that are international, invite people to share their views, try to understand where they're coming from. And I think that's what universities, you know, should be doing. We should be encouraging that and being, be, uh, you know, really leading that, that conversation, not dictating it, but just inviting it and, and welcoming different points of view. So I would like to now um, open up the floor for questions, because I know that some of you may, may have questions, and we'd really like to hear what you're thinking and try to answer them. So we'll, we have um, runners with microphones that are coming around, and we'll, if you raise your hand, uh, they will call on you, and we will bring a microphone to you. And who's doing the, who's calling out the? I'll start on this side. Okay. Uh, the lights are in our face, so yeah. excuse us if we That's right. turn to you late. Yes. Uh, do I just, uh, hi, thanks. It was a great talk. Uh, my question is sort of quick. I'm just wondering, like, what have been the three most influential slash favorite books for both of you? Um, I, well, it's interesting that you asked because we were just saying today, this week, I think, is the 50th anniversary of the Double Helix, um, Jim Watson's yeah. uh, famous and at one point in time infamous book, um, which actually was really a trailblazer for me as a young reader, um, showed the human process of science, warts and all, um, and I, I, was, I was very influenced by it. Um, I was also influenced um, as a young reader by, I'm, I'm a, I was very influenced by Orwell. Um, all of Orwell's books were very influential to me. In fact, have influenced my thinking. Um, and then I would say, I, I, I've dis, I discovered in writing The Gene, um, I discovered someone I had weirdly neglected, and I wrote about him recently in an essay for The New Yorker, Chesterton. Um, now, you could say, well, what about Chesterton and Gene? In fact, Chesterton wrote very deeply about eugenics. Um, he was one of the great skeptics uh, of eugenics. Um, I discovered his writing much later um, and realized that you know, there's something wonderful about his very bracing skepticism about eugenics. So those would be three books sort of picked out of a basket of thousands. How yeah. about you, Jennifer? Fascinating. Well, I have to say, I have to say that the double helix also for me was incredibly influential. I mean, that that book was probably the first book that I read, you know, back when I was in grade school about about science, and it kind of blew my mind. You know, if you've, for those of you that read it, you know, it's really a very personal history of the work that Watson and Crick and their colleagues did to discover the structure of DNA. It was really very um, eye-opening for me and really made me think about becoming a scientist for the first time. And then the other two might surprise you, or maybe not. One is, I would have to say, the John McPhee Reader. I don't know if anybody yes, here knows John McPhee, but he's a fabulous writer. And he writes about all sorts of topics. And what he does is he basically travels around and talks to interesting people. A lot of them are scientists, but some of them aren't. And he writes about it. And I found his writing to be incredibly captivating and interesting, again, sort of in my formative years. And then more recently, I read um, a biography of Dorothy Hodgkin that was also just fantastic. And you know, learning about her life, and she had, she had uh, multiple kids, and she was working at a time when it was very difficult for women in science in particular, and she prevailed, you know, and she, uh, she won the Nobel Prize. And you know, she, she did really just incredible, groundbreaking work. So I, that book was also so just a, incredibly uh, inspiring for me. Uh, there's a little note in, in the gene. I actually met Dorothy Hodgkin years ago. Um, there's a little note in the gene where when she won the Nobel Prize, the, uh, the, uh, the subtitle in one of her photographs was a housewife from Sussex or wherever she lived. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Hi. I think I'm, I'm the next uh, questioner. Um, where are you in? Wait, wait, wait. Wave to us. Wave to us. 
Okay. Oh, there you are. There you are. Yeah. Okay. Um, you t talked earlier about the cultural differences or the cultural, the difference in, cult in cultures in terms of their approach uh, to the opportunity and responsibility of gene editing. And can you kind of talk a little bit more about China or other parts of the world and what their approaches are? And I think that's an interesting piece for the public to understand where things are going in other parts of the world and what your opinions are about what's happening in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. You take that one first. Well, okay, so, so I, I, there's, you know, and again, this is really just my personal observations, right? But I, I think that what, I, what I've noticed is that um, I think in certain parts of the world where, and I'm not putting any particular country on the spot here, but I think there are parts of the world where there's an incredible eagerness to be engaging in the scientific process, right? People that are very, you know, maybe have felt not included in that in the recent history and want to get into it and want to be recognized for their work. They want to be prominent. They want to, they want to attract attention. Um, they want to, you know, make uh, progress. So I think there are motivations that go beyond uh, simple, dis, you know, the sort of the joy of discovery, which I think, you know, all scientists kind of share. But, you know, there also are people that are thinking about, um, you know, uh, really kind of putting their country or their culture on the map in terms of, you know, re international recognition. So I think that we're seeing that there is some of that that's driving um, the push towards certain kind of edgier, I would say, applications of something like gene editing. And, um, and, and that's where we just need to be, be careful. And, uh, and, and I, I think that uh, it, it just requires, and again, what I've observed is that there's a desire on the part of scientists to be respected by their colleagues, to be uh, accepted by their colleagues. So I think there is a willingness and an interest in engaging in sort of an international consensus around what we all consider to be appropriate use of technologies. That's, what, that's just my observation. Um, and, and I think that's what we should be encouraging because, you know, culturally people do approach these things differently. And, and I would say that even the microcultures in science are different. We were talking about, um, the, you know, once in a while I'll speak with um, someone like George Church. Um, I actually did a public conversation with George and um, George is a big, I talked about, you know, George is a big enthusiast of really opening it, opening this field up. Um, he, I think he would, I think it's fair to say he would be an enthusiast of making directed manipulations in human sperm and eggs. Um, mm -hmm. And he thinks that's his brain. Um, I think, I think like a physician first. Um, my, my first thing that comes out of my brain is, is this, are, are we ending suffering? You know, how can I first do no harm is the first thing that comes out of my brain. Uh, people's brains are hooked up differently. And I do think that people's cultural brains are hooked up differently. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there's a need for provocation. Yes, there's a need to, need to do edgy work to put people on the map. But, but someone who's grown up in, I grew up in India, the cultural brain, the, you know, what we think is permissible and not permissible is different. We, 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 we have different uh, understanding, for instance, of where life begins. Um, yeah. And that is important. Um, and it's so important that, um, that, in fact, you know, there will be places, there are places that are drawing lines, which then the lines don't exist across the border. Um, and, and science will... Science will move uh, in accordance to that. People will, if, if you if you want to if you want to make genetic changes in human sperm and eggs, um, as a scientist, you will relocate to a place. If you badly wanted to do that, you'll mm -hmm. find a place to do it in the world. So I think it's an important. It's that's why I keep coming back to this question. We need to have some sense of boundary. That's my physician brain speaking. First, do no harm brain speaking. Um, we have to have some boundaries. I don't know how to reach them, uh, but I think they're important. Yeah. Hi, question up here. So one of the most surprising things about genetics for me was that effectively 97% of it, of you know, DNA itself is non-coding, right? Um, and for a while, there was sort of the dead space, and you just assume that introns were there for no reason. Um, and every time I look at the literature still, it's always kind of vague and confusing. And it's like, well, you know, introns may do something, it may have some rule. But I, I guess my question is, what is the current sort of attitude um, 
towards introns in general with respect to DNA? And do you think CRISPR will ever become so advanced such that, you know, these kinds of concerns are going to become necessary and whether we're going to understand something else about that? I understand that's kind of theoretical. Um, well, <laughs> we'll <find each> <laughs> well, so let, let's, let, let's just, just explain some terminology uh, first, yeah. because uh, uh, just to widen out the, the question. So one of the things, one of the surprising things that we've learned, that we learned as biologists, um, in fact, this, this happens to be the 40th year of the discovery of splicing, gene splicing. Uh, and uh, there was a big symposium, I, I went to it. Um, and so it turns out that, in fact, uh, when you a gene in the in the genome is often broken up into parts, and they're long parts that are spliced out or removed when that gene finally becomes a mature RNA, which then gives a protein. So introns are those long parts that are removed, exons are the parts that ultimately make their way into becoming protein, and the question has to do with, well, what about all those introns and also the other space, the uh, intergenic spaces, um, which had, we, we, for a long time, were called junk DNA. That's a term that we inherited from the 19th the history is interesting of that term. We inherited that term for really no good reason. Uh, we inherited that term from the 1960s and 1970s when our understanding of the genome was much, much more limited. Um, my one thought about this is, is, is for cancer, um, uh, it, it's turning out that those introns and that the intergenic spaces are turning out to be extraordinarily important. Um, yeah. Not all of it, but, but much of it. Um, uh, Jennifer, you referred to some of this. Uh, it's not only important in terms of regulating gene function. Um, it is important in terms of the way DNA folds in space, and that also regulates gene function. And some parts of it will turn out to be unimportant. There are lots of viruses that sank their way into the genome, uh, which have been silenced. Um, in fact, there are old systems to silence vi these viruses that might pop their heads up um, uh, from the genome. So um, it's, an, it's, it's an active space. But I, all I can tell you is that in cancer, um, these previously non-functional elements of DNA are turning out to becoming extraordinarily important. And by the way, how are we finding out that they're extraordinarily important? By using CRISPR. Um, by chucking them out and all of a sudden seeing that they, in fact, they influence gene function in ways that we hadn't thought about before. In cancer, that's a, that's a, that's a huge area of research. Um, I don't know what yeah, your thoughts are. I don't have anything to add. That's exactly right. Cool. Um, over here. Yeah, sorry. Um, my question is regarding the accessibility of uh, gene therapy and CRISPR systems. And um, I mean, currently, a treatment with antisense oligonucleotides is $400,000 a year. And do you ever see these technologies helping the entire world or just more well-developed nations? Yeah, well, that's it's a, it's a great question. It's a really important question. It's something that you know I am thinking about a lot. I think a lot of people. It's this is on a lot of people's minds. And you know, whenever there's a new technology, um, you know, you sort of ask, is this doing, a, you know, what is this doing to really help people globally versus creating even more inequalities, right? And, and I think we'd all like to see it do the former and not the latter. But you know, inevitably, when you have new technologies, it's expensive to develop those. And um, if you want to motivate uh, companies, especially to do the work that's necessary to create a therapeutic and go through all, cl all the clinical trials that are necessary, that, you know, just uh, there is a big uh, investment involved. And that, that does lead to high costs of those kinds of treatments. How do, you, how do you deal with that? So one of the things that I'm involved in right now is some very active, very exciting discussions with our clinical colleagues at UC San Francisco. So through the Innovative Genomics Institute, we've been working on something called the Genome Surgery Center. It's in its fledgling stages. But the real idea behind this is to address exactly the issue that you're raising, is that you know, I think none of us want to see these technologies develop to help the 0.01%, right? We really want to see them develop to help a much larger swath of people. And so how do you do that? How do you get there and deal with the realities of the costs of development? And, um, and so there's some really creative ideas that are coming out of this. We have um, 
Here, of course, at UC Berkeley, we have a lot of people that are, uh, that are thinking about this from the standpoint of economics, sociology, history, uh, philosophy that we're engaging with also at Stanford uh, University. And so you know, we have this great intellectual community here in the Bay Area to really tackle this. And I'd really like to see us take that on very directly and uh, find ways to develop, uh, for example, you know, just to give you an example, um, what if you could find a way to treat a large swath of people that have a particular genetic disease using one configuration of a gene editing uh, uh, technology that wouldn't require individual clinical trials for each one. This would really reduce costs. So we're looking into ways that we can streamline that. And to do that, we really need to bring together people that are doing the technology development with those that are uh, clinicians, who they, they know their patients and they know what the technology needs to be able to do. And so it's, you know, it's, a, it's a great challenge, and we're, you know, I think we're on the cusp of being able to, to tackle it. I mean, sickle cell disease is, a, is, is going to be one of the first examples yeah. of this, um, you know, how we tackle this. It's really going to be one of the models, um, because um, uh, as a hematologist, I've taken care of hundreds of patients, yeah. young men and women, um, often African-American men and women with sickle cell disease. Yeah. Uh, it's a devastating disease, debilitating disease, um, you know, pain crises, uh, opioid addiction that comes with dealing with these pain crises. Um, so it's, it's a tough disease. Um, it is a disease that I think is going to be very amenable to um, gene editing based technologies and transplantation. Um, it is on the cusp of becoming very amenable to all of these. And the question is, how are we gonna price that? Um, and will we create gene, a gene therapy overclass and a gene therapy underclass? Um, so that's one area that I think that at least people like me are very actively watching. Thalassemia is another area. We're on the cusp of these. Um, and, and I think those would be models of trying to figure out, can we offer gene editing to people who really need it um, without excluding them from the using with cost barriers? Yeah. Um, you have the mic, yeah. I have a microphone, so okay. maybe I'm next. Go for it. <laughs> um, that, that was a really uh, f um, fascinating discussion just now because I might, from reading uh, uh, some of uh, your or the book, The Gene, and uh, also just you know uh, thinking about what we're going to do. The, the first thing that comes to mind. This wasn't wasn't my initial thing I was going to talk about, but is the first. It's it, wonderful to solve diseases. But is the first disease, disease we're going to solve be a white disease? You know, and that's just as an aside based on what you were talking about here, uh, or you know, because, and what you presented about underprivileged or people or where the money is, et cetera, uh, Dr. Doudna. But then I was thinking, so whoever well, the solves quick, the quick that. The quick answer is I, I, I don't think so. I think that, that the first disease that we're going to solve, I hope, is a disease of true suffering. Uh, which involves the most amenable, which is most amenable to th these technologies, don't you think, Jennifer? I do. I, I think that that's the first disease. I, I, I hope so. Yeah. And won't it be? And it'll be fantastic when we solve that first disease. But then my question was, or where I was fantasizing, and let's fantasize for a minute. Well, our first trip to Mars was a little bit tough. Okay, um, there were a certain group of people that went there. A number of people died there, and uh, didn't really. Um, this is the fantasy, right? I see. And I and see. didn't really um, <laughs> and didn't really uh, didn't really come out the way they wanted it to. But we're going back to Mars. Shouldn't we be pure adapted? We need to modify our corneas so they perhaps don't, uh, 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 so we're not blind when we get there through extended space travel. Maybe we need to modify our gut so that we can eat this simple organism that we can grow on Mars. Uh, perhaps we should also address the issues about our bones so we won't collapse and break like pretzels when we get out on Mars. You should come, so come to here our we're workshop pre-adapting people. We're, Pardon me? I say come to our workshop on astrobiology. We're going to talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But now we're pre-adapting a group of people that becomes almost like a, a, a clade of people, if you will, that are different from everyone else because they are going to Mars. And, and that just opens up the thought about other clades of people as well for different purposes and, uh, you know, uh, and, and really put you into a territory that could be quite scary. So I, 
I can give you my two bits on this. And lots of people disagree. I don't want to go to Mars right now. I'd rather, I'd rather focus on cancer. Um, uh, so, <laughs> sure, I mean, you know, it just doesn't seem to be, it, it, to me, it's, the question is, I mean, yes, the fantasy is lovely. My pers lots of people disagree with me. Um, I actually got into a strange argument with, uh, uh, with Jeff Bezos about going to the moon. <laughs> Um, you know, I, the moon is a faraway place which is very toxic for human beings. It's not a great place to carry heavy things to because it's very expensive. It's not a great place to put anything in. There's a reason it's, you know, there's a reason there's no, there's a reason we, are, we aren't going there. It has no atmosphere. So I'd rather focus on curing cancer and, and other diseases, but I understand it that there's a desire to create a, to, to escape these earthly coils. Um, it doesn't fascinate me as a question. I don't know. Is it, are you fascinated by the question? I'm fascinated by the question, but I, but I, but I'm even more fascinated by asking asking the audience to ask us one more question, and then we're going to bring this to a close. So, can, do we have one more burning question? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, first of all, uh, I can already foresee many ways in which genetic editing could be beneficial to. Um, curing diseases and just ending suffering, as you were mentioning. Um, but what I was wondering is, from what I know and what I learned, a lot of um, muta mutations occur um, just naturally within like evolution. So I was wondering how um, your th or what your thoughts were on how genetic diversity could be affected by editing and um, changing our genome. Well, the short answer is not much anytime soon, right? Because you know we're, what we're talking about is making very targeted changes to the DNA of cells that would be, at least in the, in the near term, this is going to be done in people that in, in cells where it's not a heritable change, right? So you're really making a targeted change in a, in a tissue or an organ in a patient um, or in blood cells, for example, for sickle cell disease and that sort of thing. Um, but in the, if you think, you know, in the longer term, um, I still think that, you know, there's always going to be a background number of mutations that are occurring. Every cell, you know, in every uh, cell division leads to some random changes to DNA that happen due to, you know, just sort of various, various sort of natural processes. And what we're talking about here is really just making, you know, one individual or maybe just a handful of individual targeted changes. So if you think about that in the context of, of evolution, um, you know, you, you, they, they're, sort of, they're sort of intermeshed, right? And you're, you're always going to have this background set of changes that are happening. I think the p potential to, you know, to control those, you know, changes and introduce changes that are going to have a real impact on on disease is is a powerful one. And um, but I think as you get from this this conversation today, you know, this is not going to happen in you know in a lar in a, any kind of a large sense in the human population anytime soon. I don't know how you. Would, I, I'd would put a word that. of warning on on that. I think it's a very important question. The question of the of the of diminishing human diversity and having respect for human variation is an incredibly important point. I just often like to give you the following example: privatize eugenics in the hands of uh, in the hands of the citizens of some parts of northern India has already created a dysgenic state where, because of the infant because of infant neglect or because of selective abortion. The gender ratio in these parts, in some parts of the world, has now moved to 800 women, 800 girls, to 1,000 boys. Hmm. It's a profoundly abnormal, unnatural, nowhere in human history have we had 800 girls to 1,000 boys. And that's mainly because of a combination of reasons, but mainly driven by the idea that one genetic makeup is inferior, quote unquote, to the other genetic makeup. So there's no state mandate. In fact, the state prevents you from doing this. But privatized eugenics has already diminished human diversity radically in some places. So I, ha I have to say, we have to be extraordinarily careful, even, in, even in, in handing over to private individuals, private citizens, the capacity to select their own genomes or the genomes of their children. This is such a primeval desire to have the best children, is a primeval human desire. 
And it is so primeval that left in the hands of people without cultural guidance, without broad dialogue, without inclusivity, without equality, um, there is a rapid chance of it devolving into a, um, into a, a diminishment or a reduction of natural human variation and diversity. Thank you for saying that because it's a very, it's a very important point and we've seen it happen. Interesting. Yeah. Should we? I think we're, we're, we're at the end of our discussion, but we want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, thank you to the chancellors of UC Berkeley and UCSF. And thank our, you for hosting me. And, our, for ho and the, our hosts and, and uh, all of you for attending. And uh, we hope that you'll continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.